to announce uh, our first keynote and uh, of, of my with Meghna Jayant. And this is, like I said earlier, this is like a dream come true and over and over, it's like a dream come to reload. It because the first time I listened to Meghna was in um, GDC in uh, San Francisco. And I was like, I, I, I just thought that we have to have uh, her in India. And a long time back when I played this amazing game called 80 Days, uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine and she said that uh, the game designer is Meghna Jayant. I was like, uh, is she does she have an Indian connection? And she said yes. I was like, really? And it was like totally mind blowing for me. It was like, oh my god, this is this is so fantastic, right? And uh, so we've we've been we've really really wanted to uh, have Meghna with us for a long time, and it is it is a matter of pride that uh, Digra India is finally able to kind of uh, welcome her. So I'm just going to quickly kind of introduce Meghna, who doesn't need an introduction, but uh, I will because that is uh, uh, well, just to know what the chair uh, that's not what the chair does. So Meghna Jayant is an award-winning writer and narrative designer. Her game Eighty Days and Anti-Colonial Retrofuturist Retelling of Verne's classic novel won the Independent Game uh, Festival's Narrative Award, earned four BAFTA nominations, including Best Story, and was named Times Game of the Year. She won a Writers Guild of Great Britain Award in 2015 for her work on 80 Days, and a Writers Guild of America Award in 2018 as part of Horizon Zero Dawn's writing team. She con contributes world building, story design, and writing to narratives. Her particular interests are elegant choice design, sociological speculations, branching narratives, and subverting the design tropes of conventional protagonism. So before I hand you over to uh, Meghna, I would request all uh, participants to please uh, keep yourselves on mute. And uh, if you have, uh, we will have to have a question answer session at the end, but please post your questions on the chat box and we'll take it from there. Uh, um, once again, so welcome Meghna Jayant. Uh, we are so happy to have you. Over to Meghna. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really hoping that my talk is going to be kind of appropriate to the time. Um, so I'm so honored to be here. Uh, as I attempted to structure and restructure this talk, um, trying to organize the various uh, imperial pleasures in game design that I wanted to talk about, um, I've tried to work out what's important to include and how deeply to examine certain ideas and how systematic I should be and how playful or concise. There are parts of this talk which aren't fully developed and parts I'm less sure about, but that I felt compelled to include. Um, I dearly wish I had slides, but this week has been a difficult one in the games industry as um, many weeks in the games industry are, uh, with recent investigative reports into worker abuses and cover-ups at Activision Blizzard King. Um, blame Bobby Kotick for the lack of my slides. So you'll have to bear with me through some of the sticky bits of this talk. Uh, this is an easy territory to navigate and articulate. It's all very personal and profoundly connected with so many parts of my identity um, as an Indian, as a woman, as a writer and designer, as an immigrant here in Britain, and as someone who lives and loves and traverses two worlds, British and Indian, each of them shaped by a history of conquest. There's so much horror and dislocation and suppression in this history, but I wouldn't exist without it. Uh, and there are times that I feel like a foreigner in both of my homes, despite the privileges and passports of caste and religion, education and class. I don't belong easily to either nation. Um, and I have to see myself as both. I'm gonna keep going. So I like to say sometimes that I'm so Indian that I'm British and I'm so British that I'm Indian. And I guess it's in trying to find myself that I came to decolonization. <clears throat> it's not an abstraction for me. The theory and practice of it is self-preservation as I think it is for so many of us. Uh, I've had to, in, and in trying to understand and practice decolonization, I've had to grapple with capitalism. They're intertwined deeply. And that's why I'll be using the term colonialism, capitalism colonialism in my talk to describe its effects. For me, it's impossible to talk about decolonizing video games without talking about the world and how it's structured. 
Our world is profoundly shaped and ordered by Anglo-American imperialism, the American empire of global capital um, and racial and colonial hierarchy is a continuity with British and European colonialism. We don't live in a post-colonial world. Video games as artifacts are only made possible by the kinds of technologies, knowledge systems, collaborations, platforms, structures, and even excesses of capitalism, colonialism. In a world of technologically mediated alienation and proliferating images and globalized culture, I would go so far as to say that the video game is the highest form of capitalist art. In terms of sheer revenue, we're bigger than Hollywood and our aesthetics and influence have seeped into every part of culture, movies, books, television, internet, culture, and even global politics. So it's impossible, I think, not to see the video game as a particularly imperial pleasure. Many of the technologies that power video games um, were developed by American military funding and DARPA, and the global industry is still dominated by the Anglo-American imagination. It's no coincidence that most mainstream video games present the world to the player at the barrel of a gun and that killing and war are fundamental mechanics and themes. The gun is still the fundamental tool that we give players to interact with the world. War and conquest as pleasurable ways of being in the world are fantasies of empire. Clearly the empire thrives in the way that mainstream video games present the world to the player. Um, and imagine their players and worlds. So I think there are many ways in which the cultural dominance of video games right now can only be understood in terms of the video game's potential as a tool of empire, easily harnessed to the task of colonizing the imagination in order to bring more subjects into its extractive grasp and remake them as consumers. So is it even possible to make a video game that resists capitalism, colonialism, which is a question I really began to ask myself as I wrote this talk? Or um, is this industry, my industry, too hopelessly mired in these powerful systems and structures for any of our work within them to be anything but tools of oppression? But I suppose if video games are effective tools uh, for the oppressor, that could also imply that they can be effective tools in the struggle against oppression, or at the very least, that they are tools of oppression which are worth sabotaging and turning to different purposes. The fact that this cultural territory is so contested, I think, speaks to its value. It's important, I think, to resist the colonization of video games because of the increasing cultural dominance of the medium, and specifically because of how effective video games are as tools of cultural imperialism. This space is one that shouldn't be ceded to dominant culture. At least that's the reason that I do what I do. And um, the reason that I'm so happy to be talking with you all here today at this particular conference um, at Degra India and about this specific topic. So personally, I believe that those of us who make our living engaging with human fantasies and imaginations ought to have a healthy paranoia of the systems of power that seek to order it. There are fantasies that make the world clearer or to help people bear it. There are fantasies that numb us and dupe us or capture our imaginations in order to extract from us something which we did not consent to give. Fantasies as cover for the operations of colonialist capitalist power. There is no conquest possible without first imagining it. So whose imaginations do we inhabit? Whose fantasies do we portray? What emotions and selfhood do we protect inside our simulated worlds? What do we take from our players when they are with us in our games? And what do we leave with them? What are our responsibilities to our players as human beings and not simply consumers? What purposes do we intentionally or unwittingly serve in our designing? Who do we make safe and what do we endanger? We have to ask ourselves these questions if we don't want to be unwitting accomplices in the Anglo-American imperial project, which I would also describe as capitalism, colonialism, and which we could also describe in the contemporary world as neoliberalism. 
So how can we design spaces, interactions, opportunities, and embodiments outside of these imaginings using cultural artifacts that are deeply embedded within these structures? I think the role of the artist, how I think about it, um, uh, is of the opportunity of the artist to say to the player, hey, this dark dream that you've been sold, it's not the only dream in town. And here, dream a better one with me. Dream a hundred different ones. There is an alternative. Let's imagine our way out of this reality together. So today I want to name <clears throat> some of the fantasies of capitalism, colonialism that video games are invited to collude with in order to open up possibilities of resistance, subversion and, and sabotage to these invitations. I don't know that it's as helpful to enumerate individual counter fantasies or counter strategies as it is to name the dominant fantasy, um, which thrives and evades us through making itself invisible and even normative. If you're familiar with my work, you'll know that um, I have in the past talked about my specific strategies of resistance and subversion. And while much of it is relevant to the topic today, I want as far as possible to avoid uh, talking in detail about those because um, I want to avoid the sense of closure, definitiveness and categorization and instead leave the space open for play, exploration and discussion in the hopes that others will take these thoughts forward and imagine and design in ways I could have never anticipated. Naming, defining and categorization are colonial modes and by turning them on the dominant fantasy, I hope to explode its singular vision and replication of sameness into infinities of possibility. So in a, in a, in a broad sense, what are the design features of capitalist colonialist systems and entities? What are its tendencies? Contemporary culture is about filling up every nook and cranny of our time to colonize and expand into the available space. These entities will in, even invent new spaces to fulfill their fantasies of endless exploitation when they're at risk of saturation. If we think about Facebook's attempts to colonize the internet in the developing world and its recent push towards a new digital territory ripe for colonization in the metaverse. Capitalist colonialist entities are designed to extract profit or attention or whatever is desired by the system from human beings and the world with no regard for our integrity or needs. On a human level, these are systems that are not designed around us as humans, but rather see us as consumers. This type of design is only interested in the parts of us which can be consumed. Our money, our attention, our engagement, our time, with no regard for the social, cultural, or psychological effects that result. These systems are unable to see value in anything outside of what it values, and our well-being, agency, dignity, health, self-esteem are not parameters which are factored into this type of design logic, which is why we live in a world of technology which cheerfully robs us of agency, time, self-esteem and connection and fosters addiction, dependence, hatred, fear, insecurity and even social and interpersonal violence. Under capitalism, colonialism, I don't think we have to intentionally design for these outcomes but they're almost inevitable unless we deliberately and intentionally design against them. In game design, we can see this as a tendency towards attention-seeking design, design which seeks to colonize the player's time and attention to be demanding within the attention economy. Possessive design, which is games that guilt or punish you for leaving them and reward you for engagement. Games which pull on the player's attention neurotically because any gap or loosening of control or potential moment of inattention is a moment where the player, the consumer, may become distracted because there are a thousand other bright pleasures in competition for the consumer's attention. My friend um, V21 on Twitter talked about, uh, just the other day, talked about wanting to design games that you could fall asleep to but they also pointed out the lack of sales potential in games that are decide, designed to let go of you. Capitalist colonialist design then pulls us away from the possibility of calming games, gentle ones, designing for letting go, and instead 
move us towards designing for increased spectacle and bombast. So what are the pleasures that are easy to offer players um, and people inside a culture of spectacle and alienation? It seems to me that capitalism, colonialism replicates itself at multiple levels. I think we can talk about these types of systems and entities that seek their own benefit at the cost of anything else as abusive systems and the pleasures that it offers to individuals are similarly abusive ones. The predatory and shallow system offers predatory and shallow pleasures to those within it and valorizes those pleasures. Those of domination, individualism is freedom, power, authority, violence instead of the erotic and consumption in lieu of self-actualization. Which brings me to the idea of white protagonism. Um, so Umberto Eco talks about the model reader as embedded in the text as a function of the way in which we understand text and various game scholars that I'm sure all of you are familiar with have brought these ideas into our understanding of how games work in terms of thinking about the model player that is imagined by the game's designers as they encode meaning into the work. The model player of the video game is, I think, the white man. Video games are by cultural default and deeply ingrained design prejudice shaped by the white and male imagination. I would argue that there is a conscious or subconscious conflation of the model player as the white player. Um, there's an entire talk in that, um, especially around marketing and, and demographics and what's considered to be marketable, um, but I don't really have time for that today, unfortunately. But the interactive and embodied qualities of video games, I think, cause a deep slippage in the concepts of player and protagonist. The imagined white player has resulted, I think, in the white protagonist as the model protagonist. White protagonism is, I would suggest, an ingrained and at times even unspoken set of rules, instincts, tendencies, and design frameworks around the very idea of protagonism in games. The kinds of fantasies that the model designer, um, in, in, in the sense of the model author, who is also white and male, shall we say, has embedded into the supposedly objective notion of the protagonist are in desperate need of marking and being made visible. And I believe probably real, reveal more about the desires, pleasures, anxieties, intuitions, and fears of the white male designer than the possibilities of protagonism. By marking and learning to identify the whiteness of the protagonist and seeing it as a product of a design space that is structured by capitalism, colonialism, and the Anglo-American imagination specifically, I hope that we'll be able to reveal possibilities for protagonism and game design that have been occluded, dismissed, discarded, shadowed, or even suppressed. Before I share some of these um, injunctions of white protagonism with you, uh, I want to make clear that this isn't a definitive schema, nor do all white protagonists exhibit these qualities all the time. Nor do protagonists have to be read as white by players to exhibit white protagonism. I'm talking here about whiteness as normative, default, whiteness that stands in lieu of humanity and personhood, and, and, and in fact is expressed as, as the fullest expression of, of, of personhood. So I want to share these injunctions because I believe that these are rules which I consider, to borrow a phrase from Ursula Le Guin, um, not only fake, but pernicious. And I would like to encourage my fellow designers to not only to break them, um, knowing exactly what we are doing and why. So let's start with a simple one. The white protagonist is a hero. So I have talked about this specific conception of protagonism before um, in a bunch of publicly available talks um, on YouTube and various other places. And I've written about this in terms of decentering protagonists and refusing the hero narrative. Um, and I think it's fairly well understood the white savior fantasy, the lone hero fantasy. Um, we see it outside of games as well. Um, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this one, apart from one thought about the sheer scale of heroism that is offered to players in video games. Um, 
which I think is quite unusual, the idea that the fate of the world rests on you seems to me personally as a very vapid and artistically counterproductive conceit. And I find its prevalence in video games to be baffling. Um, it is a white fantasy and an imperial one. The fantasy of saving the world is in fact necessary to conquering it. And this exact fantasy has provided moral cover for British imperialism and brutal conquests and wars in the material world. I would argue that games in which the protagonist mass murders and brutalizes their way into saving the world are a reflection of these types of fantasies which have enabled white imperial conquest and continue to enable white global domination. The transformation of brutality, murder, domination, exploitation, and subjugation of the other into something noble, good, worthwhile, and even necessary. I would also say that this fantasy is pernicious because it perhaps counterintuitively breeds a kind of apathy and nihilism, an acceptance of the status quo. Something is only worth doing if I change the world. My actions mean nothing unless I see a result immediately. I saw this sort of going into, I suppose, anecdote. I saw this last year in certain, certain white friends of mine who responded to their new knowledge of racial injustice and pervasive structural inequality with an indignation and anger that quickly transformed into pessimism and wallowing in guilt and shame. The systems that we struggle against in the contemporary world that must be struggled against will not be brought down by a lone hero. Structural racism will not be solved by a white savior. These fantasies are so pervasive that the denial of the white savior fantasy, the hero fantasy, uh, the idea of a worthwhile struggle that is not structured like a war with its directly felt actions and consequences, winners and losers and promised resolutions, um, feels like a denial of agency to people. The idea that the only worthwhile way to be in the world is to be a conqueror, that changing the world, reshaping it, is the only interesting way of being within it, that freedom and agency for oneself necessitates choosing for others, all the way up to this, to this large scale idea of choosing for the entire world. These are all, I would argue, imperial fantasies and pleasures. So this also leads me to the next injunction of white protagonism. The white protagonist is the only entity that matters in the world, which is to say the white protagonist is the only human in a world of objects. Every story in the world is there for the white protagonist's consumption and every NPC exists to guide, support, aid, cheer, antagonize, or be an obstacle to the white protagonist's journey. In the ultimate fantasy, Every tree and rock, every en environmental object can be acted upon and extracted from. Nothing in the game world has utility or purpose or value beyond what is given to it by the white protagonist. If it contains secrets, they are there to be uncovered. Every hidden place is a temptation. The world holding something away from the white protagonist is not a cue for the player to leave it alone, but a coy invitation. I would also draw a comparison here with what Amitav Ghosh um, in, his, um, in his recent book, The Nutmeg's Curse, which is, which is fantastic, describes as the colonial fantasy of the inert world. Um, so from the recent LA Times interview with Andrew Malmuth, I'm just going to quote from that. Ghosh traces how colonial systems of domination shaped both racialized ideologies towards enslaved people alongside mechanistic ideologies around the natural world, casting all non-human entities as inert, machine-like, and devoid of vitality. He quotes Ben Ehrenreich, Ehrenreich, who observed that only once we imagined the world as dead could we dedicate ourselves to making it so. Colonialism for Gauche is in part a process of subjugating and reducing to muteness an entire universe of beings that was once thought of as having agency, powers of communication, and the ability to make meaning. Animals, trees, volcanoes, nutmegs. Um, 
Excellent, right, okay. So uh, my next injunction then, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, I think there's, again, this is one of the, the points that I would love to explore in more detail, but um, I think I, I will leave that um, in implication for now. Um, the next injunction of white protagonism is the white protagonist will increase in power as the story unfolds. So I think we think we have to think here about RPG progression mechanics and the pervasive notion of uh, leveling up. The power increase of the protagonist, their journey to power is usually a linear one. They accrue more and more power as they progress through the game. Uh, which kind of mirrors this colonial idea of human progress as linear from savagery to civilization, the forward momentum of the world and people within it as a journey towards perfection guided by the ingenuity of the colonizer player. While the white protagonist may briefly experience powerlessness or a brief reversal of fortunes, usually their items, equipment and power will be returned to the levels they were before the reversal. Rarely do games ask white protagonists to re-earn what they have lost as a result of an overtly narrative or mechanistic decision. So I think we can contrast this to roguelikes where the protagonist's uh, progress is destroyed upon death. Uh, the the, but the responsibility for this death is carefully designed to feel as though it is the player's responsibility. Good roguelike games make players feel as though the, as the progress and the increase of power is still occurring in the form of increased player mastery, even if the protagonist is returned to the start. In a sense, the roguelike can get away with punishing and denying the protagonist this power fantasy because the player feels a sense of linear progress and power to compensate for the protagonist's failures and repetitions which still ideally result in incremental progression on the part of the protagonist. So in that way, I think the roguelike still remains within the logics of white protagonism. So the white protagonist experiences limitation of their power solely to overcome it. So I think this as an injunction really narrows the kinds of stories that we can tell and leads us into um, uncomfortable narratives and thematic expressions in video games. For instance, the white protagonist who experiences oppression must overcome it. Um, Deus Ex is a very lovely example of this where, uh, where the protagonist is invited to play a, a, an oppressed minority, but within the first 10 minutes of the game, their, their job in the game um, gives them essentially like a passport outside of this oppression. So this idea of um, overcoming oppression is not the experience most of us have of structural oppression. Most of us learn to live within it and find power, agency, meaning and success that is not reliant on the idea of ending our oppression. In a way, this results um, this injunction of white protagonism results in a kind of oppression tourism from which the white protagonist inevitably escapes and is therefore a dishonest fantasy. So the white protagonist must act and rarely will be acted upon. And we could also say this in some ways as the white protagonist will decide. I think the specific idea that I'm talking about here is that deciding in of itself is pleasurable and to be decided for is not pleasurable, which feels very paradoxical. Um, the white protagonist choices are made meaningful and pleasurable because they decide for others, but uh, the resistance to the white protagonist being decided for or acted upon implies that this is an unpleasant situation. To act then is to be a protagonist, which is to be human. To be acted upon is to be an NPC who is dehumanized. So this pleasure that is being offered to players in under white protagonism reveals itself to be a sadistic thrill. The pleasure of domination that is either presented as an unquestioned right or justified as morally righteous or necessary. The white protagonist then bears the white man's burden. They must choose for others who cannot choose for themselves. Counter to this, I would ask, are our choices only meaningful if we choose for other people? 
Can we not design for and imagine pleasures which respect the agency and dignity of other people and indeed the world itself? It seems to me that we are in desperate need of these kinds of conceptions, pleasures and imaginings in the world today. So next up, the white protagonist will be forgiven. So this can be connected to the previous injunctions. Whatever actions are committed by the white protagonist over the course of the game must be forgiven by the end. The white protagonist can commit no sins that cannot be redeemed. The possibility of future goodness must outweigh the evils of the past. Um, I think it's quite easy to see this as a fantasy of the white colonizer who must believe in future redemption and an inherent goodness which can be reclaimed despite historical action in order to rationalize the evils of empire, slavery, et cetera, et cetera, and still retain a sense of moral worth and even superiority. Um, I think, you know, we can see this also play out in the Rittenhouse verdict that happened today, uh, his sort of judgment of being not guilty of, of murder by a, a um, racist justice system that is deeply invested in the idea of white innocence. So, there are games that specifically invert this idea, refusing to redeem or forgive the protagonist, and in fact, leveraging this for dramatic effect. Yes, spec ops the line, that's the, uh, the example in this genre. Uh, but I think this inversion is a trick which can really only be pulled once um, and doesn't have a, a huge amount of, of, of potential and possibility there. I think it's better maybe to think about this notion in terms of asking as designers what it is that we ask our players to do over the course of the game, mechanically and narratively, and to accept that the action of the game is its theme. The moral lesson of a video game cannot be delivered through story at the end. It is delivered through the experience of play. What the player does must be pleasurable or satisfying for a video game to work, or you know, usually at least. And we as designers spend an enormous amount of time working this out, finding the core gameplay loop. The core loop, its themes, its pleasures will be forgiven because the player must be forgiven for engaging in it because the player did not choose it, um, even if the protagonist did. To refuse to forgive the player using the story then is the game narrative equivalent of grabbing someone's hand, hitting them in the face with it, and then shouting, stop hitting yourself. Um, so this is an injunction that, that video games often attempt to subvert using story. And I would tend to say that um, to, to try and do this is often artistically or thematically unsuccessful or undermining. Instead, I would tend to say that this injunction can, should, is, can be usefully accepted as a design constraint and intentionally leveraged in narrative design, which kind of makes me wonder whether maybe this is an injunction of protagonism rather than white protagonism. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that one to you guys. All right, so um, the next injunction is uh, the white protagonist is an individualist. So while it might seem as though protagonism is by its nature individualist, I would argue that that is not the case. And there are many ways in which protagonism could subvert these individualist fantasies. It is the white protagonist who is mired in individualist ideology, reflecting the contemporary evolution of the rational rights-bearing enlightenment man of the Anglo-American imagination, um, which is something that Pankaj Mishra talks about, um, I think in a very compelling way in his book, Bland Fanatics. Um, this is a conception of personhood that is ideologically useful to the neoliberal world in which we live. It's convenient to capitalist colonialist systems of extraction and profit to place moral responsibility and the burden for our own happiness and well being onto the individual and deflect responsibility away from their own systemic operation. While we are caught in our own individual psychodramas in pursuit of the good life, 
we that we are promised unchecked capitalism colonialism runs rampant the irresponsibility of these systems the suffering they cause and sustain themselves upon is made possible by burdening us the individual with the responsibility that the system refuses to shoulder making our suffering self-inflicted when in reality it has been visited upon us it, the idea that we are responsible as individuals for protecting ourselves against vast and incomprehensibly powerful systems with, with infinite resources is, I think, a maniacal idea. We simply don't have the resources or capability to do this as individuals. We are, in fact, extraordinarily powerless, not just in the material world, but inside the grasp of the dark algorithms of social media and the internet, which invisibly and irresistibly pattern our experiences to better serve corporate interests. But in order to place this responsibility uh, upon us as humans, capitalism, colonialism had to invent or rather perfect a new type of person, the ultimate individualist, the utility maximizing animal, the self optimizing man, the self interested strategic and calculated being who lives in a fantasy of a rational, understandable and graspable world that acts in predictable ways. A human being who is able to navigate complex systems guided by the light of their own self interest, where our ability to choose is presented as freedom even if our choices themselves are hugely circumscribed by the operations of vast and impossibly complicated systems. We are given the power to choose, and if we fail, it is because we chose wrongly, and if we succeed, it is because we chose correctly. So doesn't this sound like a video game to you? The video game world um, lends itself I think very easily to fantasies of neoliberal individualism. And the white protagonist allows us to play out these false pleasures. The white protagonist is in this way easily harnessed by the ideologies of capitalism, colonialism. The white protagonist and video games which conform to these logics participate in the project of hiding from the player and the individual their own fundamental powerlessness, um, both in the game and I would argue in the material world as well. Providing an illusion, a fantasy of agency and self-expression, which makes it easier to bear the lack of those same needs um, in the real world. So it is necessary, I think, to subvert this type of fantasy and these fantasies because they are of such uh, great value to our oppressors. All right, the white protagonist is uniquely suited to protagonism. So this is the idea of someone being uniquely suited to protagonism by virtue of character, situation, or ability. The idea that protagonism itself is not special unless it's thematically buttressed. The idea that uh, these abilities must be unique or at the very least unusual. So I'm going to break my own rule briefly and talk about Sable, which is a recently released indie game that I worked on. Sable subverts this very intentionally and I feel is a much better experience because of it. The protagonist is a young woman called Sable who lives in a post-capitalist desert world where everyone chooses and wears a mask which represents their vocation. She sets out on a journey of self-discovery that comprises the action of the game. Everyone in the world, but has, as a protagonist, her circumstances are not unique. Everyone in this world goes on this journey. Other people in the world have the same powers and abilities. This makes the world warm and familiar. The protagonist's experience is grounded in a shared one, a communal one. Every adult she meets has gone through this experience and has experiences or well-meaning or annoying advice. Um, it's a bit of an anti-simulator, actually, now that I think about it. Um, it is her journey, uh, but she is not alone. This kind of warmth, this very human experience is not possible within the schema of white protagonism and uniqueness. And, and I would argue that Sable is much more interesting for defying these rules. Um, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm coming to the end of my time, but I do have 
I'm, I'm going to keep going um, and hopefully we'll have time for some questions afterwards. All right, so uh, the white protagonist wields a gun. I don't think that that requires much more contextualization. The white protagonist remakes the world as self-expression. So here, I think we can also see games like Crusader Kings or Civilization as inside the schema of white protagonism. This is a type of power fantasy of individual self-expression in the mode of global domination, which is quite interesting. Um, so I think here's my last point about white protagonism. Um, the white protagonist does not see race uh, nor does the game see the white protagonist through the lens of race. So in this way, I think we can see cos um, games which offer cosmetic character customization on the level of skin color to be engaged in white protagonism. Um, uh, the, I, I think the division, I'm, I'm not sure which one, I've completely forgotten, but um, in, the, in, in the, the game, The Division, the experience of carrying a gun in imagined a game world America as a black protagonist is unmarked and undifferentiated from the experience of being a white protagonist carrying a gun. Um, the skin color of the protagonist therefore doesn't matter. The fantasy of power is a white one. So this is interestingly subverted, I think, in Mafia 3, where the protagonist, Lincoln Clay, um, is a black Vietnam War veteran. And there are designed moments in the game where white NPCs clutch their purses close to them as the protagonist walks past them. The protagonist is marked by his race. The game systems see him within a racial hierarchy, which also means that the game's world does not elide race, but admits and articulates it breaking a cardinal rule of contemporary white supremacy. Arguably, this game overall still fits into the category of a fantasy of white voyeurism, as it operates as a brief vacation into an experience of blackness for the model white player. But it's unusual and interesting uh, because the protagonist is clearly racially marked and racially marked specifically with blackness. When video games do racially mark their protagonists, it is much more often in terms of species than race. The metaphor of species for race, I think, is crystal clear. And in fact, overtly acknowledged in the way that fantasy games use race to denote species. Racial difference in video games is often explored in this type of metaphorical manner, which I would say produces unintentional and problematic thematic effects and implications. In this way, the metaphorization of race in video games colludes in whiteness and coloniality through participating in the project of the occlusion of race and its operations. Clarity about race, the admission of its reality and the articulation of its operations is violently suppressed and resisted by dominant culture, which thrives through the intentional propagation of model and confusion, which serves whiteness. Pankaj Mishra, in, in, in his wonderful book, Bland Fanatics, talks about how the cultural and intellectual fantasies and delusions of Anglo-American imperialism have resulted in a store of false knowledge, which has devastating impacts on the way Anglo-Americans and those under its regime understand themselves and the world and act upon it. A huge area of false knowledge under Anglo-Americanism is around the operations of race and the function of whiteness. As whiteness is unmarked, I would suggest that maybe it, it could be even harder for people who are white to recognize the delusion that is whiteness. There is a store of, this is a store of false knowledge and a re regime of repression and suppression, which require an enormous amount of intellectual and emotional labor to overcome, particularly if you're white. Those of us who are not white are marked in such a way that it's impossible for us to live inside the delusion that racial hierarchy does not exist. No matter our other privileges, we cannot escape the lesson of whiteness. We must see it no matter the cost and white people may choose to see it and must willingly pay the toll. It is also possible for white people to return to unseeing if the cost of seeing race feels too high. However, those of us who seek liberation and truth must intentionally commit ourselves to this work. So bringing this to games design, there is in games design, as there is in every sphere of knowledge, culture, and technology under Anglo-Americanism, an enormous store, I think, of false knowledge, which masquerades as truth about the world while obscuring it from us. 
The overwhelming whiteness of game design has consequences in what it imagines and defines as best practice. Many of the things that I have learned and practiced as a narrative designer, I have come to through a process of unlearning received wisdom or through following my own natural instincts or informed instincts, which have often led me to places that are interestingly counter to the ways protagonism and players are often conceptualized and designed for, or towards pleasures and satisfactions that feel glaringly absent from familiar design frameworks. Um, I'm certainly not always right, and I'm certainly not more knowledge or more experienced, but that um, I have come to recognize that my embodied experience of the world as a brown woman, as someone other to the Anglo-American imagination, as someone outside of whiteness, is core to what makes me good at what I do. Um, and also what causes me to question the expected approaches. I think I have done better and more interesting work when I have followed these instincts and sensitivities and brought the decolonial thinking that informs how I approach the world and other concepts from outside of the knowledge systems of game design into my narrative design work. The rules of game design are based on a shaky foundation and riddled with occlusions, contradictions, and misconceptions that must be cleared away if we have any investment in our medium, being able to see and represent the world and everything within it with honesty, which if we have any pretensions to art or think of ourselves as designers in any way as artists, we must desire keenly. This then is the task before us, a vital one, to clear away the cobwebs and delusions of whiteness and empire embedded into our industry's store of knowledge and to see and represent the world in its complexity and infinite variety. As game designers, our own repressions, evasions and self delusions put us at an artistic disadvantage, particularly when these are shared by the majority of our colleagues. Our world is deeply and fundamentally ordered by colonial and racial hierarchy and by anti-blackness. To commit ourselves to unlearning the delusions of our culture are a vital part of the game designers ongoing education, as much and I would say even more vital than keeping up with the latest games or technologies to enable to bring us to bring to life meaningful and honest game worlds and systems. So this is an idea that I, I felt was really important to articulate here in this venue because this task is one that I feel will fall disproportionately to young designers, marginalized designers, and those designing games in the global south. To those designers, I really want to say design with confidence and authority, and don't feel that you must pay your dues or follow in the footsteps of those who came before, or feel intimidated or lesser because you are less conversant with the familiar frameworks and established wisdoms. The games industry is in love with its own image and is extraordinarily self-regarding and demanding of fealty to its idols. This is profoundly creatively undesirable. And personally, I reject this entire approach. And if you require permission to reject it from someone who pays their bills making games, then I am here to give you that permission. In fact, I encourage you not to seek validation or acceptance into these cultural and professional frameworks. We need perspectives that are outward looking and rebellious and fresh and not beholden to what has come before or what is considered possible or desirable. The canon of game design is white and male and inside the Anglo-American imagination. And we are desperately in need of ways out of it as designers, as players, and more importantly, as humans alive in the world today. So white protagonism, I think, is pernicious. Uh, and I believe important to name and design against because it is one of the ways in which video games are made hostile places for non-white people, colonized people, marginalized peoples. It's a conditional welcome. Come in and play with the toys that belong to us. A magnanimity with a sneer underneath it. You're lucky to be here. To be a brown player inhabiting white protagonism is to be an immigrant in the white man's game world which engenders a feeling of precarity, trespass, and dislocation. White players, on the other hand, are constantly told by video games, we are lucky to have you. Incidentally, I think it's also um, entirely possible to write and design a, a, a white protagonist that subverts white protagonism. Um, and if any designers out there are engaged in this kind of work or intending to make games with white protagonists, I would really suggest you look at Barna Hesse's Eight White Identities and identify where the protagonist falls and attempt to move your white protagonist ident identity closer to 
white criticalness, white traitorousness, or white abolitionism. Um, okay, so as I draw to the end of my talk, I hope you'll forgive me a few uh, observations that occurred to me as I prepared it. I've read more game theory in preparation for this talk than I have in the last few years. And interestingly, I think some of the ways in which I feel about it are similar to how I feel about the established patterns of game design thinking. Um, both are an attempt, I feel, to describe, to define what games are. But in my view, what games are is a function of the people who make them and the history and the precedents that we build the present edifice upon, uh, which are embedded in the Anglo-American imagination and structure. To me, what games are are the possibilities as yet unexplored, which are hidden by what currently is. I suppose this speaks to maybe my view of the world as a narrative designer. The choices that we don't offer players are as important and perhaps more important than the choices that we design for them. Emily Short um, said something similar in one of her talks, which I'm not sure was recorded about the player, that the choices the player does make shape the experience of play as deeply as the choices they do not make. And I think that's what I am interested in. Um, the choices unmade in terms of games and game design. Uh, the territory that isn't the map, what is as a shadow occluding our vision of what could be, which is infinitely more rich and interesting and redolent with branching possibility. So I was deeply struck by this paragraph in Donella Meadows' book, The Limits of Growth. People don't need, I'm, I'm, this is a, a quote from her, people don't need electronic entertainment. They need something interesting to occupy their minds and emotions and so forth. Trying to fulfill real, but non-material needs for identity, community, self-esteem, challenge, love, joy with material things is to set up an unquenchable appetite for false solutions to never satisfied longings. A society that allows itself to admit and articulate its non-material needs and to find non-material ways to satisfy them would require much lower material and energy throughputs and would provide much higher levels of human fulfillment. I have to say, I can't argue with that at all, even though it clearly implies that video games are not something we need. But while we are here, all still willingly or unwillingly trapped in this imperial mode of living, I think that Meadows has um, great insights into roots out of capitalist colonialist design thinking to see the player's desires that we are engaged in the work of satisfying as non-material to pull into game design vocabularies and practices, strategies to fulfill these needs for identity, self-esteem, community, challenge, love, joy, rather than defer these needs, or at the very least be respectful of these needs um, in the way that we approach game design. To think about our imaginative work as game designers, also as an attempt to articulate and admit in our game worlds, the desires that our capitalist colonialist society does not admit or articulate. This would be, I think, of enormous value to our players and would feel like meaningful work um, and feels like meaningful work to me as a narrative designer. To see consumerism as a kind of longing for spiritual connection in a world which has less and less space for the sacred, the mysterious, the numinous, opens up the idea of what we do in the games industry as more than straightforwardly material we touch on much deeper longings, fantasies, and desires. We sell dreams. And every industry that does has its miracle workers as well as its snake oil salesmen. And those of us who work in this industry, I think, have the choice of which one we would like to be. As game designers, if we are invested in liberation and roots out of capitalist colonialist thinking, we can begin by resisting our own instincts towards authority, deliberately designing against obedience and subjugation, designing systems that allow for inattention or a kind of looseness that could allow players to care more or less over the course of play. I, I suppose what, I, I, what I'm saying here is, is seeing a kind of design that pulls away from authored authoritarian wholeness into a, cre a, a which is a creative mode of control towards a looser, more fragmented, spacious types of design which makes room for different types of players, play perspectives and abilities. In editing this talk, I realized that given the points I was making, you might be forgiven for thinking that as game designers, we've barely understood human psychology, but that really isn't the case. We are adept at manipulating it. That is in the nature of our work. But the reality of our industry is that 
all of the knowledge and even empathic understanding of human psychology is most often deployed in the service of extracting profit rather than in the service of the player's real human needs. The balance of our conceptions as designers of the player as a human being and the player as consumer has never been more fraughtly contested. And as game designers and as storytellers, I believe it is necessary for us to resist the ongoing engulfment of the player by the consumer if we have any interest in retaining and expanding the space for humanity in our increasingly alienated, bombastic, spectacular landscapes. I'm nearly there, I, I promise. It is important, I think, as a narrative designer or a game designer to seek to destroy your own one's own ego to make space for the player's ego, not in the sense of pandering to it or player-centric design, um, but rather to destroy our own egos as obstacles to our work, which requires understanding, empathy, care, and consideration of the player. If games are about self-actualization, they should be about the self-actualization of the player and not the self-actualization of the designer. As designers, I believe we should pursue honesty, respect, compassion, and ethicality in our work over a, con a conventionally better story or elegant mechanics or design. These human qualities will guide us to serving our players' real needs instead of their shallow desires. And those real needs must be at the forefront of our practice. To pursue this over demonstrating our skill or craft or seeking profit is what I mean when I say we must annihilate our own egos. The meaning of the game is, of course, more than the collection of words, images, sounds, and code. It's more even than the experience of play. To me, it's what the player is left with, the internal transformation that may occur or the need that has been met or articulated or acknowledged as simple as a need for rest in order to pursue other desires or diversion from the material world while resisting making false promises. We should, as designers, be in collusion with our players, defectors to the dominant powers who benefit from our collective numbness in action, atomization, and exploitation. To do this, I do think we will have to perform acts of evasion, intentional resistance, and even daring escape and constantly guard ourselves against encroachment and co-optation. And we must also admit of the certainty of failures and incomplete successes. But uh, I believe that the only real failure would be to give up the attempt. I do think that video games can be tools for struggle through playful transformation and, and reimagining systems, structures, societies, and worlds, Video games can invite people to see the possibility of transformation in the material world at a time where neoliberalism tells us that there is no alternative. We can counter the stifling of the imagination. It is easier to remake the structures of capitalism colonialism inside the world of a game than it is, it is to remake the real world, and which is exactly why we should be doing it more and often. The video game worlds we design are worlds of fantasy and the transformations we make and share with our players as game designers are imaginative ones, not material ones. But the material world is constantly remade through acts of collective fantasy. To imagine remaking the world is not a revolution, but it is a spark. So in conclusion, I think overall, it is a worthwhile thing to participate in the project of imagining pleasures and satisfactions outside of the ones on offer. It is worthwhile to lay bare the mechanisms of empire and capital in our work. It is worthwhile also to make things that sustain or nourish or even distract people trying to survive the modern world, even if they don't necessarily counter the capitalist colonialist imagination. But to me, the most worthwhile type of work, the type of games that I would wish to see in the world and to be part of making are games which through our imaginings make the revolution irresistible even if that revolution makes us redundant. And that's me. Thank you so much for uh, bearing with me through all of that. Thank you for such a fascinating talk, Meg. I mean, we were just listening with rapt attention. There has been like, everybody's just been frozen on the WhatsApp groups and everything. And it's just like, everybody's just listening with rapt attention. It, it, uh, not just us, some of our parents are also listening to you. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah, just, that's what I hear. So uh, we have three questions here. I don't know if we have time for more. Uh, probably not because there are three uh, huge questions. Uh, but uh, 
I'm just going to quickly uh, also add my, uh, uh, you know, like quick uh, point here about uh, is it, can the subaltern play? Is it yeah. possible for the subaltern to play in that kind of sense, really? I mean, as, as you've just uh, talked about, I mean, when, when the subaltern, what is this? And so I, I will start with, uh, before, before kind of, I don't want to come into this anymore, but uh, just to start with, uh, uh, the question that Hironyo Mukherjee has ra raised here, uh, he's asked, video games often as narrative media mediums work as routes of escapism that empower the protagonist or player and invest agency in their actions, which is the meat of the dopamine fueled core gameplay loop that makes games enjoyable. Besides being informed by dominant hegemonic social, societal structures in place, if looked at from a Jungian or Campbellian, I think Joseph Campbell, yeah, uh, this narrative structure of empowerment can be seen as rooted in the primordial psyche of the human mind. Keeping mm -hmm. these in mind, <laughs> oops, that's quite a long question. Wow. Uh, well, can one conceptualize a game narrative that is subversive of the mentioned um, white, uh, uh, okay, now we just lost it, sorry. Uh, can, can, can one just kind of, uh, uh, Right. Uh, just bear with me. Sorry. Uh, no, sure, sure. Okay, so, uh, uh, is that even? Uh, this is a really long question. But uh, I think what he means to ask, mm -hmm. ask is that if it is basically kind of like hard coded in your psyche, as as per Jung or Joseph Campbell, uh, is it possible? Uh, I mean, you know. Uh, is it possible to think of another system, right? You know, yes. a, you know, a challenge to the white protagonism system. So yeah, I, you know, I, I would say that actually Joseph Campbell is like single-handedly responsible oh for God. encoding this idea into the, the idea of what of, of of whiteness really. And I think this isn't really a function of personhood, but rather a function of the way we conceptualize whiteness as personhood. Yeah. So, uh, and and I, you know, I'm a lot less familiar with Jung. Um, but I would tend to think that perhaps Jung is also um, enmeshed in this fantasy as well. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that actually that this is that is not fundamental to personhood as as dominant and prevalent as an idea that is and, and that it is possible to design for agency um, yeah. outside of that. I, you know, I, I think we see that. In, in a purely anecdotal fashion, just in our own interpersonal relations, right? I mean, this is an example I've, I've talked about before, but like when we we feel agency in our real interactions with our friends, giving a, you know a friend who comes to you for your advice or with a problem, when we give them our advice, we don't feel we feel agency just by engaging with them in that problem. The agency and power don't result from our friend following our advice to the letter you know it might be annoying that they don't but it isn't fundamentally um a an insult to our own power and agency that they 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 don't do that and and i think so much of how we are in the world is is not is is really conceptualized outside of, of that idea of power and agency um, uh, yeah, so I, I think I might just leave that one there unless there's there's. Oh, I, I, was, I was just thinking, you know, the very word protagonist, because you mm -hmm. mentioned about protagonist, it comes from protagonists, right? The whole idea of the agon, it has yeah. to be kind of a competition. It comes back from the ancient Greek kind of mm -hmm. notions of poetics. Uh, why not have a different kind of poetics all together? Really? That's what I'm kind of looking at at the yes. moment. Yes, uh, yes. Why have to have Agon? Why why kind of have a character in kind of put agonist, antagonist, better agonist or whatever? Yes. So well, that's kind right. Of and and I and I think we can see that you know if we look at say the novel, right? Like you know, yeah. be, begun as a very as a, yeah. as the singular vision, the experience of the individual, but we now have multiple perspectives, yeah. challenged ideas of what it means to be the protagonist of a novel and novels that don't have protagonists that are collective pieces. And or, I think that's entirely possible in video or games. speaking about something that cannot be spoken about. I remember Masha the Davis Teradacta is a story which is, they see a kind of painting on a wall or kind of mm. and everybody has different theories, but the person who mm. can talk about it can't speak. And yeah. so how do you represent that? Why do we always have to 
So uh, I'll move on to the second question. This is also a long question, bear with me. Uh, it is by Gaurav Kalyani. It says, it's all there in the chat, but I'll just read it out. Uh, big fan of your work. Hi, Meg. Big fan of your work. It was a fascinating talk. Look for, looking forward to playing table soon. Your talk was about racial dynamics and whiteness. But if I can, I want to ask a few questions focusing uh, on gaming and game industry in India. Taking hmm. the risk of offending some people, spaces and discourses such as this one are very elite, to be honest. I'm not against post-colonial theory and its importance, but the way it's often used in Indian scholarship is often to hide behind it and avoid discussing caste and power dynamics yes. associated with it. To me, this is apparent in game studies too, sadly. So how can this change? What needs to be done to promote Dalit Bahujan Adivasi DBA stories, voices and representation in game studies and gaming industry in general? The games industry in India is rising and more games will get produced in India. But we all know what stories most of them are going to present and who are going to produce them. So it is possible to ensure that the DBA representation and voices are not lost, especially, uh, cons uh, especially considering the staggering digital divide in India. Or are video games and game studies uh, are and will remain too elite for DBA struggles and narratives? Sorry, I know big questions, no easy answers. No, but I uh, thank you for for um, bringing that up, Gaurav, and and that's something um, I really, if I had more time, would have loved to get into more in in my talk. I, I really think that in 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 many ways, um, everything um, talking about whiteness has to also can can really be applied to India in the sense of caste supremacy, and I think white supremacy and caste supremacy can be very much seen as mirrors and interrelated, um, and. I certainly don't want to participate in this, the ways in which uh, certain tendencies in, in I think, uh, post-colonial and Indian scholarship that focus overtly on whiteness and, and as, as, as you were saying, use that to elide our own caste supremacy or focus on us as brown and as Indian, as um, subaltern and as oppressed and, you know, to hide the fact that we are, you know, and I, you know, I was born a Hindu and, you know, for, for many reasons, like the privilege that I, I kind of outlined at the beginning of my talk, that, that we are, maybe many of the people in, engaged in this discussion are actually part of that dominant class here in India. Um, you know, in terms of, in terms of how do we, how do we undo this and how do we make space? I think, um, you know, that's, I think that is a really big and worthwhile question. Uh, but I think um, just to keep it in the context of, 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 I guess, my talk, I would say I would really encourage people um, from India to really um, think about the ways in which I describe whiteness and, 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 and really think about that in terms of caste supremacy and think about it in terms of like dominant culture and to not see ourselves as disincluded from that or purely, you know, and, and I think this is the thing, like identity is intersectional and complex, right? Our, we, may, we may be oppressed in one schema and we may be the oppressor um, in another one. Um, but I think in general, the, the, what we should strive for is the, the strategies that we use to subvert whiteness are strategies of subverting dominant culture in general, and they should also very much be applied to subverting dominant culture in whatever system we find ourselves in. Um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I, I really think that possibly there's like an entire conference <laughs> that really ought to be devoted to, to this topic. And I would, um, I would be very, very interested to to listen and learn from um, Dalit Bahujan and Adivasi voices in this space. But yeah, I, I think that's an amazing point to, to definitely keep in mind that this is still a very elite discussion that, that we Absolutely. are having here. So Meg, uh, Meghna, there is one uh, uh, additional note by Aurita Bhattacharya on this, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, this kind of topic. So he says mm -hmm. that I want to add to the discussion, take a cue from previous questions, importance of escapism working as a reprieve from mm -hmm. daily oppressive structure, 
was a point that was raised by Kuruvilla Babu Shankar Rao in his paper, mm -hmm. where he looked at the importance of games and ex escapism in Dalit autobiography. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's you know. And I also wanted to add that in 2019, we had a, a conference, Games and Literary Theory, in Calcutta, where there was, in Kolkata, there was a fantastic paper on Dalit games. And uh, yeah, so it was uh, also uh, kind of a really, you know, um, so, and certainly with the staggering digital divide, and, uh, mm -hmm. I, I will say that although we are in a very elitist position, uh, mm -hmm. as I agree, but we are also subject to this staggering digital divide because this conference has been organized entirely by one academic and all students and out of our own pockets with like various, you know, absolutely no money and we were begging for kind of space and representation really. Thanks, thanks to Digra for giving us the Zoom account to use because earlier we used to kind of have like 40 minutes uh, of talk and then go into another, ask people to log out and log back in again. So yeah. this, is, this is a very contested space here. In, yeah. uh, although it's elitist in some senses, it is also kind of also at a disadvantage in, in if you look at it in terms of the global north and it's just very incipient conversations. Let's start having these conversations, more of these conversations really, yes. and yes. having exactly. more of these. And then uh, of course, uh, certainly where we should uh, have more conversations where we can represent kind of um, more different kinds of voices, I think. But uh, yeah, and, and and as you rightly said, I mean, the, the Talib Bahujan Adivasi, and also, also uh, I would also include kind of, uh, uh, well, there was this wonderful talk on tribes. Really, what, mm. what is what is the tribe? Uh, tribe and what is you know uh, all all of these kind of uh, uh, discourses to enter. And, mm. and uh, incidentally, the Degra Diversity Group now includes caste as one of the categories as well. It it has done that. It has been do, doing so since the last few months. Now, after we recommended that we also look at the uh, to discrimination on the basis of caste, which is something that wasn't some you know there initially. So we are making some very, very little progress, but I'm sure with people like Gaurav and others uh, joining the discussion and uh, yourselves, all of you, this will be a better than the forum, at least the forum to start uh, talking about this thing. And then, uh, so there's one more question. I, there is a question by Ochinto Devnath, and he asks, in the beginning, you say uh, that video games are the highest or is the highest form of capitalist art. Uh, my question is that in that capitalist art, who is playing the role of the proletariat? Uh, how does uh, primitive accumulation, uh, how is primitive ac accumulation applicable to the specific uh, context of this highest form of capitalist art? Gosh, I would love to be able to answer that, but like I, I have to say, um, I, I mean, perhaps perhaps the question could, it would be, I think it would be helpful to maybe unpack that a little bit for me, but. Um, uh, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm, I talk about it as the, the, the highest form of capitalist art in much more the sense of sort of, I guess, um, culture. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I have a good answer to that, but I kind of open up the, the floor to anyone who does. Um, uh, Ajit, do you want to come in and ask, uh, say, say more, but uh, certainly there's this um, uh, there, there are these kind of uh, uh, books on Marxism and video games. Which yeah. If you look at looked at them, right? Uh, Marx, Marx of the Arcade is the book I'm thinking of at the moment. Really, I, I, I just, I just quickly kind of tell you uh, uh, who yes, who was written. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's it's quite interesting to uh, yes, it's by Jamie Woodcock, Marx of the Arcade. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, you, you could kind of, and also, also, I would say that uh, Nick Dyer, uh, Witherford, and Greg DePoiter's Games of Empire uh, are uh, they're, they're like really, they're not not much about colonialism, but they're talking about kind of how uh, companies like Electronic Arts and others, like you know, uh, they they have kind of this monopoly and capitalism and things like that. So uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't also have an easy answer to who is the proletariat, because sometimes it is the capitalist who is also the proletariat here, in the sense <laughs> I mean, that yeah. it keeps like, shifting in a way. But, uh, but yes, just, just two pointers of reading, I don't know, because... Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> you coming on this? But yeah. No, absolutely. And I would not claim myself to be a uh, a, a Marxist scholar. Uh, <laughs> I've got great great skills. So, but... uh, Asha has just said that the proletariat could be very well as yeah, immaterial, immaterial uh, labor. So yeah, so all that. Well, so, <laughs> so, so Tiziana Terranova talks about immaterial labor and all that. So yeah. Well, yeah, or immaterial labor in the in the form of like the the like crafting systems or in uh, or like digital goods, things like that. Um, you know, we're we're increasingly in this world uh, where we're asked to buy digital and immaterial goods and games. Well, we are um, buying, and at the same time, we are performing things in games as well. Yeah. Uh, so all that. I mean, if you look at things like gold farming and things like that, that's like that makes it much more obvious. But and we are also sort of, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So, the coming horrors. Yes. So uh, I, I know we've gone uh, 15 minutes over our time, but that's still kind of quite uh, just kind of last comment by Mari Amaro says that your speech reminds me a lot of Paulo Freire's quote, when education is not liberating, the dream of the oppressed is to be the oppressor. <laughs> oh my God. I actually, you know, I this there's like what is described the greatest ship host of all time. Sorry. Um, for swearing, but like that was meant to be one of my slides. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's like this picture of a cat, um, you know, like batting uh, a, away an alligator and then a cat in like an, an alligator costume, like set next to each other. <laughs> which I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you something in response to that comment. That is, that is called, that is, do you see it? No. Oh no, I think your the, the screen is, is kind of, um, let, let, let me just remove the let, let yeah. me just remove the thing yeah uh, can you see this is Tiku's tiger this is a toy yeah. where you, you have you have this tiger kind of eating eating this yeah. British soldier so that's the oppressor <laughs> the oppressed wanting to be the oppressor in toy form but also I, I mean sorry in, in a less light-hearted note I was thinking about uh, Augusto Boas the theater of the oppressed which is a very different kind of poetics altogether. And it's not about wanting to be the oppressor. It's just wanting about, uh, to put the idea of oppression in play. Oppression mm. as play and recognizing it. So, well, I think, uh, well, uh, thank you again, uh, Magna, for, for making the time. It is very early, I know, in the UK at the moment. And thanks for this absolutely spellbinding keynote. And thank you all who asked these questions. Thank you. Uh, you don't know Gaurav uh, Oitro uh, Ochinto uh, for asking these very difficult questions and, and uh, making us think. And I hope that you keep kind of keep up this uh, you know questioning spirit and you know question game designers, question games, question yourselves, players. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, thank you all so much. Um, this has been just such a pleasure and a great honor. So 